Good morning. This is uh, lecture number two for the uh, Interpreting in Superior Courts felony course. Uh, in the first lecture, we look at the, um, is it number two? Number three, I believe it's number two. Um, in the first lecture, we looked at uh, um, various different things uh, that have to do with um, you know, typical uh, arraignment and, 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 and what happens when they're, um, the, um, you know, we, we discussed the difference between the misdemeanor and the felony course, and we discussed that the fact that this is actually felony course, yeah. Uh, so um, we discussed the difference between misdemeanor and felony courts, courses, Mainly the difference is that the crimes are very different, but the, all the rights and all the consequences of the plea remain the same. Uh, we also looked at some formats that are used in uh, felony court uh, in terms of the plea, where the, the judge is required to indicate what is the low term, the mid term, and the high term. Uh, we look at that, and that, therefore that translates to us into expressions that uh, sound like um, the, um, let's just get the stream out a little bit better volume so that I, you can hear, because I know you won't be able to hear me. There you go. So uh, we look at uh, how the, uh, the judge will actually indicate in the plea. The judge will say, for example, uh, armed robbery is a one, two, three year in state prison which we know that that really means the low term is one year, one year, the mid term is two, and the high term is three years. We look at all that, and then we also look at what type of crimes we would see in a typical felony case as interpreters, and, and we said that uh, drugs are the main ones that we see. Occasionally, you get some armed robbery, some attempted murder, uh, particularly related to um, crimes created by, um, uh, or that, that are committed by gang members. And uh, we also even uh, briefly discuss the, uh, the job of uh, the interpreter in a felony court. And I mentioned that usually it is much easier to work in felony court than in misdemeanor court, um, because there is, um, everything is at, moves at a slower pace, and there is a lot of kind of, idle time, um, and therefore there is, the pressure is not there. Uh, we discussed the fact that in felony court, usually you have to also deal with juvenile cases, because generally the courthouse that deals with felony matters, criminal matters, they also have juvenile and they also have uh, family law. So those are two areas that we don't have much information since this course is on criminal matters. But in your um, class manual, there is a reference material, I believe, in page 50, 55 on, I think. And if you look at that, you will see terminology on juvenile court. The terminology dealing with family law is something we're going to see in the last course because the state examinations, many exam versions, will include family law uh, terminology, and therefore that's why we study it mainly for the final, for the uh, state examination. We also uh, indicated that whenever there was a trial in felony court, the, uh, the trial involved, um, it, it was much longer and it involves a higher level of stress. So the real Stress for the interpreters whenever there is a trial and the interpreter is assigned to interpret for a witness. And we said that the, uh, in la last week that one of the reasons why that happens is because clearly if somebody makes a mistake, an interpreter makes a mistake, and it is not caught by any of the parties, then the punishment may be substantially more. Uh, a mistake can actually increase one year in state prison. For example, if they are talking about carrying a gun, even if the gun was not used, but if it was loaded, that automatically adds one year in state prison. So if there are questions to that effect and the interpreter makes a mistake and you know 
a simple mistake, like um, I, it, it, let's say the witness said, no traía ninguna pistola, and the interpreter said, I had a gun, just basic, um, you know, and it's, it could happen after interpreting for a period of time. Then that, you automatically gave a year extra for that particular defendant. So you can see the consequences of misinterpretations in felony court are much greater than in misdemeanor cases. Because in misdemeanor cases, the maximum punishment you can get is one year. And a mistake may, could be maybe a couple of weeks or a month extra. And um, therefore, it's not something that it is so critical compared to, to felony court. Uh, we also mentioned that during the plea, and that we do most, most of the time in felony courts, we're gonna be doing pleas. And those pleas are very straightforward. They're similar to what we studied in our misdemeanor um, course. Uh, but um, the truth of the matter is that um, they are much more detail-oriented. Uh, and by that, I mean that, um, you know, we, they, they, there might be some conditions. Usually, there is no probation associated with, that, with an offer. <clears throat> but what's, uh, what could be much more uh, detail-oriented are conditions of, uh, in order to receive parole. So there might be some extra material there that you will find to be um, perhaps uh, a little bit more difficult to deal with. But in general, the same vocabulary that is used for misdemeanor courts, you use it for felony courts. There is absolutely no difference there. So I don't see any major problems in terms of the terminology that, uh, that you will be using. So having said that, what we would like to do is we'd like to take a look at um, basically the typical structure. What First of all, we want to look at right now is what to do if the case involves uh, gangs. And that's important because when we are talking about a gang-related crime, usually the people who commit the crimes um, do speak English. And therefore, the question is, where, why, why do you need an interpreter? Uh, quite often, the court will give an interpreter to the parents, will assign an interpreter to the parents of that gang member who may not speak English. And the parents will not be located where the defendant is located. Uh, the parents will be sitting in the audience portion. And um, this is almost always true when dealing with juvenile cases. Uh, see, gang-related crimes start before the person reaches 18. So you, do, you see a lot of, uh, of regular crimes, one could say, but also gang-related crimes at the age of 14, 15, 16, 17, in which case the, the, the parents are allowed to be in the courtroom, just the parents. No one else could be except the parties involved in the case and the interpreter, of course. So if you are to interpret a gang-related crime in a juvenile uh, courtroom, the first thing you're going to notice as an interpreter is that you're not interpreting for the child or for the minor. You're really interpreting for the parents. Second thing is that there, when you walk into the courtroom, there is no one in the courtroom. There is no additional cases that are being called in that courtroom. Because in the case of juvenile, in juvenile matters, the uh, identity of the criminal or the person who committed the crime uh, has to be guarded. And therefore, only people that are part of the case or the parents of the of the minor are allowed in the courtroom and you will be allowed if they require an interpreter the first problem that we have when we are uh, when we interpret in the um, in, in, in a juvenile case like that the very first problem is that we are interpreting for parents in the audience portion and the audience portion sometimes is kind of far from where the judge is located and you can think of it this way. I don't know if you look at a, at a typical courtroom, you're going to see um, the following. Uh, this is kind of a birth view. Uh, so if this is the courtroom, right, there is a partition here. Here is where the audience is located. And there are usually two tables, one for the prosecution, one for the defense. 
And here's the judge, and the judge is sitting right here. And in the case of juvenile cases, you're going to have here probation. This is going to be probation department. Because what they uh, want to do in a case of ju in Juby um, is to assign probation as much as possible. The whole idea about these juvenile cases is to re uh, give them an opportunity, give the defendant an opportunity, you know, to go back to the society as soon as possible and not to punish the defendant in such a way or the minor in such a way that is going to be there for him, it's going to be locked up for years. That's why sometimes, you know, for a 14 year old kid who kill, a, kill another kid, maybe accidental or not, but they might be only on probation. So, but the, the problem that we have is that if you look at it, let parents might be located right here, and that's where the interpreters and parents are. So this is the parents slash and the interpreters are there, or the interpreter rather, one only. But so we are, if you're here, that you can kind of hear the judge because the voice is projected in that direction, but the attorney's voices are projected in the opposite direction the uh, probation um, department officers' voices are projected in that direction. So when we are here, we, we have a really hard time hearing these two, as well as the probation, but mainly these two. We can hear the judge fairly well, but these two are very difficult to hear. So it, it, it often happens that you, you just simply cannot hear. And if you cannot hear, you cannot really stop the whole, I mean, the code of ethics, when you take your state exam, if they ask you a question as such as, what are you supposed to do if you cannot hear any of the parties? The answer is very clear. You have to bring that up to the judge and the judge has to make sure that you can hear. But in real life, this is a very complicated scenario. Because if every time you cannot hear one of these two attorneys, one or two, every time that you cannot hear one of these two attorneys, you're going to interrupt the proceeding, they're mo most likely they're going to kick you out. Because that uh, interruption uh, kind of affects the flow of the whole hearing. And it, it really interrupts the comprehension process of what the attorney is saying. Um, people get interrupted, they have to repeat it. So in real life, uh, usually what we do is we just basically tell the parents. So you're interpreting it until the parents, discúlpeme, pero no, no, no escuché lo que dijo el abogado. And then you continue interpreting when you can hear the attorney. So in other words, you always keep that those uh, parents in the loop, so to speak. Um, and, and you do that uh, with the sole purpose of providing information, as much information as possible, but by the same token, not interrupting the flow of the hearing. Um, as in any, uh, in any case, one thing is what's uh, a theoretical approach, what's written in books, and a different thing is what you actually do in real life. Uh, in, in, a, in a book, in a code of ethics, they're going to make sure or they're going to tell you that if you cannot hear, you got to interrupt everything and then tell the judge and everything has to be repeated. In real life, we evaluate how important uh, is that piece of information that we couldn't hear and how important it is for the parents in this case. The parents are not a party to the action. So if they do miss some parts here or there, it's not that critical. I would ask for repetition, for example, if a question is asked to a witness and, and the attorney turns to the audience portion while asking the question and I cannot hear it. That I will because I have to interpret that in the consecutive mode and I have to understand what that, uh, what that question is. Uh, I wouldn't, for example, uh, ask for a, a repetition of anything if I cannot hear, for example, an instruction that the jury is giving the the judge is giving the jury, because I'm interpreting simultaneously for the defendant, and basically what I am interpreting is what the judge is addressing another party, not the one who speaks Spanish. So if the 
party who is addressing the one who speaks Spanish cannot be heard, that needs to be uh, brought that to the court. You have to indicate that, brought up to the court. You have to indicate to the judge, you know, the interpreter, Your Honor, the interpreter was unable to hear that question. Um, if, on the other hand, the one who speaks Spanish is answering the question and you cannot hear for whatever reason, then you have to tell the judge that you couldn't hear. You say, Your Honor, the interpreter couldn't hear the answer. May the interpreter ask the witness to repeat the answer. The judge will say, certainly, Mr. Interpreter or Madam Interpreter. And then you will turn to the person and say, repita la pregunta, la respuesta, por favor. Because remember, we cannot communicate with anybody in the courtroom, anybody who speaks Spanish, certainly not with the witness. Our goal is not to have a communication or a conversation with the witness of any sort. Our goal really is to make sure that the witness, um, whatever the witness says in, in Spanish is translated to English, whatever the Spanish speaker, the speaking attorney ask is transferred into Spanish, but not to have a conversation with any of the parties. And obviously, if you turn to the person who speaks Spanish and start communicating in Spanish, it will be perceived by the rest of the people in the court, courtroom that you are having a conversation. Although it really may not be a conversation, you're just telling the person to please speak up. But since the other people don't speak Spanish, they don't know what we are talking about. And therefore, it creates um, the potential for conflict of interest and therefore being disqualified for doing something like that. So you can't really be addressing the person who speaks Spanish at any time. In fact, my advice would be not, not to even address that person before interpreting. Uh, sometimes you may find that the person uh, calls you, the person, the witness is waiting in the, in the audience portion and uh, that witness is about to testify. The judge is not on the bench yet. But of course, both attorneys are there and they may call you. And then, yes, you want to be polite up to a certain extent. Yeah, dígame, blah, 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 blah. Oh, pregunte el abogado. So you call the attorney if they have a question. They, they really have no business in asking you any type of questions because you are not an attorney. Um, they may confuse that and they may confuse you as an attorney, but they, they, the bottom line is that you will call his or her attorney. So when dealing with juvenile cases, the, when there is information that is kind of missing, and this can happen in, in adult cases as well, the idea is that you evaluate whether that information is important or is critical for that defendant. Or another way to put it at at this is you evaluate whether the information is necessary to establish that communication, i.e. the communication between the one who asks the question and he asks the question in English and the one who answers the question in Spanish. So the only time really that we have to make sure that we are getting all the, all the words in the question and all the words in the answer is precisely when you're interpreting for a witness. And when you're interpreting for a witness, that happens when you're doing the consecutive mode. It's very rare that you will not hear the question or the answer, because first of all, you are next to the person who speaks Spanish. So it's kind of difficult for you not to hear the answer. You're really standing next to the witness stand. And second, uh, the person who's asking the question in English is actually looking at the person who is going, who is being asked that question. And if that, if that person is looking at the witness and you are next to the witness, you should be able to hear it. It is more common, however, that perhaps the attorney uses a word that you don't know, and therefore you cannot transfer the message, in which case you will say, Your Honor, Your Honor you always address the judge. Uh, counsel use a term that the interpreter is unfamiliar with. May, counsel, may the interpreter ask what uh, to use another term for this particular uh, word. Um, and that's fine. And you always address the judge, right? You never, and you always say, Your Honor, the interpreter. So you call yourself the interpreter. You wouldn't say, for example, Your Honor, he used a word that I don't understand. No, that's incorrect because the court reporter will write down 
Your Honor, he used a word that I didn't understand. We'll write it, we'll assign that statement to the defendant. Because remember, for the court reporter, your voice is the voice of the defendant. Because the defendant speaks Spanish and you, you know, the court reporter only records things in English. So the court reporter is clearly going to uh, assign, um, you know, that, that, that statement to the person who who is the witness, not to you. But that's why we say the interpreter, so that that goes to the court reporter. And the court reporter now opens a new paragraph or a new participant, puts the interpreter, and then whatever the interpreter is saying. So, um, again, to make it very clear, if for whatever reason in the state exam, which they do ask you this question, they ask you what's the... Um, uh, what are you supposed to do if you cannot hear? The answer to that uh, question is ask the inter ask the judge, you know, for a repetition, um, and that regardless of what it is. But in real life, you have to evaluate the situation and determine if it is worthwhile interrupting the flow of the hearing um, in order to deliver information that really is. It is related to the defendant's case, but it, it doesn't really mean much to the defendant anyway, because the defendant has an attorney anyway next to him. So the attorney is kind of protecting the defendant's rights there. So is it worth it to do that? Well, probably not, because the risk that you face is that the judge will feel very uncomfortable because it's interrupting the flow. And interrupting the flow means that the judge has to repeat himself or herself. Uh, the attorneys don't comprehend that because there is an interruption and then they have to start, you know, kind of comprehending the question or the statement again once, start, once it's repeated. And no one in the courtroom feels comfortable with that scenario and therefore they will kick you out of the courtroom. Some judges will automatically send you out to the office and get another interpreter. And there are some judges that are, you know, they're brutal. They will say, Madam, uh, Clerk, uh, Madam Clerk, please get me another interpreter. I can't, I can't be ha holding this hearing with this interpreter interrupting me every minute or so. Sir, addressing to the interpreter, please go back to your office. And that's the way it is. Others will just finish the proceeding and then will tell the clerk, just make sure that I don't get this interpreter ever again in my courtroom. It's just interrupting the flow of the hearing. So that's reality, which is not in the books, right? Um, so for the books, for the exam, oh yes, you have to always bring that up to the judge. That is the fact that you did not understand or you couldn't hear it, uh, some information, all right? Now going back to our case of uh, the, um, the juvenile cases, when we are interpreting for the parents, Again, we are going to be facing that scenario quite often because we just cannot hear this too that well. The key in any in any case where you are not you you cannot hear uh, part of the utterance, the key is to let the person who you're interpreting for know about it. Um, don't just skip it because you couldn't hear it. Uh, you do need to. Uh, let that person know. In other words, what we want is to keep that person in the loop. And, and by that, I mean that you want to make sure that that person is, um, understands why, you know, there is a part of this, of the, of the utterance that has not been transferred. So we will say, you will be interpreting like this, so it will sound like this. Uh, so, um, El jurado debe de presentar ante todas las, debe de considerar todas las pruebas en este juzgado. Here comes the part that you didn't understand or you didn't hear it. And then you will tell the defendant, discúlpeme, pero no pude oír lo que dijo el juez. O discúlpeme, pero el juez usó una palabra que no entiendo. And then you just continue interpreting whatever, whatever once you can, you can re-engage. That's the, the, uh, the importance of you whenever you skip a term here in this practice to re-engage as soon as possible, not to wait too long. Because the judge is probably looking at, at you, make, you know, making sure that you are interpreting. You know, they do occasionally. So if they see that you're not moving your mouth, then it just, it, 
which means that you're not interpreting for them for some reason. So, so then juvenile cases, when it comes to vocabulary, you know, you do have a, a, a reference material there. But in reality, the state exam doesn't test you in juvenile cases. They should, but they don't. So it's not that critical, but don't think that it is not important. You know, it's important for real life. It's not important necessarily for the state exam. Uh, so for real life, you will be doing a lot of juvenile cases. So there is a section in your book in the reference portion towards the end that talks about juvenile cases and juvenile terminology. Uh, and I would strongly suggest that once you pass the exam and you start working for the court system, that you do pay attention to it, um, you know, and that you get ready, particularly when you know you're going to be assigned to felony court. You will be doing juvenile court in two instances. If you're assigned specifically to juvenile cases, and you'll know because they're going to tell you, oh, you got to go to um, um, juvenile court or whatever the case is. Uh, usually has names such as, for example, here we have Los Padrinos and, you know, they, they, they don't have them anymore, but they used to. And, and then you have some detention centers and, and some courts that are basically known as obviously juvenile courts. So you could be assigned the whole day there. It doesn't happen often. Maybe it happens three, four times a year unless you specifically work in juvenile court. Um, and then you may have to do juvenile cases in some felony courthouses. Because again, when you're an interpreter in a, in a court that deals with felony matters, you have to be also ready for juvenile cases and family law cases. So that's one scenario. Now we'll talk about juvenile um, family law. Let's just briefly discuss what family law is so that we can kind of complete the three different scenarios that you deal with in felony court. And the question that I always get is, do you interpret more in, of course you interpret more in felony criminal cases. That would be probably 80% of your job. And then about 15, 6, 16% will be in family law and three, four, 5% maybe in uh, juvenile cases. So what is family law? Family law is actually a civil proceeding and therefore there is nobody in custody. And there are no offers, there are no rights, there are no consequences of plea, there is nothing to do with immigration consequences and things like that. Um, specifically, when we talk about family law matters, it's just two people that cannot resolve a problem on their own. And instead of killing each other, they decide to go to the courts and have a third party, that is the judge, decide that case. That's what civil matters is. The purpose of the matters that are heard in civil court could be because of money. Usually that's the case. You know, and a you sue a company or whatever the case is. So usually it's money. Of course, it could be uh, copyright issues, that's also very popular. You use someone else's material and you claim it's yours, or you distributed someone else's material um, in the, you know, when, without any permission. Those ca also carry some criminal penalties, so there could be two cases in that, in that scenario. One for a civil matter for money and then a criminal case. Or it could be simply that you just don't want to be married to a, this person anymore. That would be family law. Or maybe you're not living together anymore. You are completely divorced. But now the issue is that the, uh, the husband is not giving enough money to the former wife for the upbringing of that child. Or it could be that the husband doesn't have the job that he had in the past and now he doesn't have the means to provide the, um, the amount of money that he provides every month for the, for the wife and the child. And therefore he's asking the judge to reduce that amount. So there could be different, different reasons. Or it could be a, simply a person, a, a minor who wants to be emancipated. Uh, so there could be a lot of different reasons why you go to civil court. In the specific case of family law court, 
The issue is that you either want to get divorced or there are some issues in an already divorced case dealing with perhaps um, the children usually. The only thing that ties the parties after they get divorced is when they have children.